Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this policy exchange and Deloitte Fringe event. We're talking about today the subject of how to make Britain uh, and its economy dynamic, fast growth, and entrepreneurial. My name is Steve Hughes. I'm the head of economic and social policy at Policy Exchange, and we've got three great panelists today who are going to speak for five or ten minutes before we open up to questions. So, on my far left is Ian Steele. He is the senior partner for Scotland and Northern Ireland for Deloitte. He's based here in Glasgow uh, and he runs the corporate finance advisory business for Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. And he's also a fully elected member of the Deloitte's board. Uh, to my immediate left is Mike Welsh, who is the managing director of Black Circles, which is a tyre online tyre business. Um, he has got a string of awards for being a good entrepreneur, and he started up his first business when you were a teenager, is that right? Fifteen. Fifteen? Yeah. Fifteen, from his parents' bedroom, with a grant from the Prince's Trust, uh, and a mobile phone, and his parents' house. Got that from the show. He set the Black Circles in 2001, and that has now got a sales turnover of around £30 million per annum. And to my right is Jeremy Brown, MP, who is the MP for Taunton Dean and has been in Parliament since 2005. Over the course of the coalition, he has held two ministerial posts, one in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and one in the Home Office, and he's recently published a book called Race Plan, which is all about how Britain fits into the world and changing global economic order. And we're going to start with Jeremy, uh, Jeremy with five or two minutes. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, the question, how can we make Britain a dynamic, fast-growth, entrepreneurial economy? I think the first precondition for our party, for all of our politicians, for our country, is to realise it's necessary. I think a lot of the debate that's taking place in Britain uh, and across Europe is uh, introverted, introspective, risk-averse. Uh, we have a hoarding instinct which is greater than a desire to try and see what new ground we can conquer. We are defensive, and I think that is an enormous mistake. We are in the part of the world, our continent, that is shrinking in importance, uh, that is a relatively smaller and smaller part of the global economy every day. And we have no God-given right to be prosperous, either privately, personally prosperous, or to enjoy the public services that prosperity funds. So I think, as a starting point, Having all of these debates in all of the party conferences about how we're going to spend more money on this and spend more money on that and fund tax cuts for this all presumes that the prosperity that comes from an entrepreneurial dynamic economy is automatic and that there is no prospect of any change in the global order, that we are going to be at the top table of world affairs politically, uh, militarily, but most importantly economically by right, that it doesn't have to be earned. And all of that is a misplaced assumption. We have to earn that place, uh, it won't be given to us. So, in the small amount of time I have, let me suggest a few areas that I think we can uh, embrace to go about that. Some of which, there is an active role for government. I'm not uh, a politician who doesn't believe in government. Uh, I'm not a pro-state politician, but I think government has a role to play. And let me give you some examples of where I think government uh, can make a difference. One of them is on physical infrastructure. Uh, I look at uh, the Victorian era, the, post, the part of, of, of time where Britain went from being a reasonably significant, but not hugely significant country in the global scheme of things, to becoming the most successful global power the world had ever seen. And how did that happen? It happened because of the Industrial Revolution, the social changes that took place, and an extraordinary can-do spirit that embrace our physical infrastructure. And you see the house buildings, you see whole parts of cities which are Victorian houses, you see all of the viaducts, you see the train lines right across the country. We have, in my view, lost that pioneering spirit. What is very striking if you go to China or you go to South Korea, many parts of the world where change is happening fastest, is you get that exhilarating sense of embracing new possibilities. Uh, and here, uh, I'm afraid we have, as I say, a more backward-looking instinct, and today's vote, the vote that took place half an hour ago on airports, is a policy, I'm afraid, our party now has, which is completely incompatible with reality. 
and completely incompatible with us being a successful country in a far more competitive world. The other area where government, I think, can play a significant role is to try and make sure that our people are equipped to succeed in a more competitive, globalised era. We are internationally successful at the top level. We have some of the best universities in the world. There are some studies that say of the top 10 universities in the world, depends how you measure these things. But of the top 10 universities in the world, six are American and four are British. That is an extraordinary success of ours. And our elite institutions, uh, both in the private sector, uh, schools, but in the state sector, and our top universities, our Russell Group universities, roughly defined, are globally competitive. And our top 20%, 25%, not an exact measurement, but the top cohort or two of our population is well served and are globally competitive and are recognised as such, which is why so many Indians and Chinese and others want to study at Oxford and Cambridge University and other institutions. But overall, we are not doing well enough. In these international league table comparisons, and I accept it is much easier to measure some academic attributes than others. It is easier to measure maths aptitude than it is to measure creativity. I accept that. But nevertheless, you don't have to choose between being creative and being good at maths. You can be both. And on the top measurements, we are not in the three disciplines that are measured for 15-year-olds in the top 20 in any of those core attributes. Whereas the new competition in Asia, South Korea, Japan, established economy, uh, Hong Kong, those dynamic parts, Singapore, those parts of Asia, are in the top 10 in all three attributes. We will not be a knowledge economy, in inverted commas, if the competition is more knowledgeable than us. So we have to raise our game dramatically in terms of our human capital. We don't have other advantages. China has advantage of sheer bulk, 1.4 billion people. We have less than 1% of the world's population. Saudi Arabia has the advantage of natural resources. We don't have anything like that level of natural resources. Panama has advantage of geographic location. That's what makes Panama an important country, or more important than it otherwise would be. We don't have that advantage. The one advantage we have is creative, inventive, opinion-forming people. But we have to be able to maximise our capacity to make it a whole team effort. We cannot rely on a well-educated elite bringing the rest of the population <coughs> through. And let me do a couple of other small points before I sit down. I think our party, I talk a bit when I go to our fringe meetings about what I've called 360 degree liberalism. It's a pretty terrible phrase, but what I'm trying to capture is a concept, which is I don't think we can afford as a party to just embrace some of the sort of facets of liberalism that we have traditionally felt most comfortable about. So for example, a sort of uh, a benevolent, sort of non-intrusive, sort of social, non-judgmental liberalism about your Light. That's important, I believe in that. Everyone at Lib Dem Conference believes in that. That's fine, but it's not taking us out of our comfort zone. I think we also need to embrace the types of liberalism that the party has not traditionally felt quite so comfortable about. So not just civil liberties and proportional representation, but the economic liberalism that is completely transforming <coughs> the entire global order. The huge dynamic rise of countries particularly in Asia, but in Latin America and elsewhere, that is lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and changing their lives fundamentally and forever. And we need to look and think, what are those attributes that are revolutionising the world in which we live? And they are choice and competition and entrepreneurialism and wealth creation. And we need to be thinking about what we can do as a party and a country to promote those attributes. So we shouldn't be thinking the whole time when we see wealth creators, how can we try and regulate them more or tax them more? <laughs> they need to sometimes be regulated. All marketplaces need to be regulated. There's a recognition that everybody will make a contribution through their tax system. But we shouldn't see the wealth creating people in the country as part of the problem. They are emphatically part of the solution. And if we are going to be a prosperous country that can hold our heads above water in a fast evolving global order, we will need to generate the money to earn that place at the top table. My final point is this, it's a bit about a state of mind as well. I think we need to be outward looking, not inward looking. 
I think when we see what is happening in the world, we have to have the confidence to believe that Britain can make a difference in our foreign policy, in our views on immigration, in our views on trade. We shouldn't be defensive the whole time. We need to see how we can be globally competitive. And I think we need to be forward-looking, not backward-looking. We shouldn't assume uh, that security lies in sticking with the tried and tested rather than embracing change. Not all change is inevitably good, but the willingness to <coughs> contemplate change in a time when the world is very rapidly transforming itself is good. And many of the changes are absolutely necessary. If you look at the FTSE 100 from 50 years ago, virtually all the companies are different. Rapid change is taking place, driven by the internet and driven by globalization. And we cannot afford to behave as if it isn't. And we can just get on with business as usual. And I think quite often in the House of Commons, that is how it feels. And in party conferences, all the parties, that is how it feels. And that is a recipe for long-term decline as a country. So we ought to be outward looking, we ought to be forward looking, we ought to be entrepreneurial, we ought to have a physical infrastructure and a human infrastructure, if I can put it in such cold terms, that are all aligned to make us a successful country. Because our liberal ambitions will be achieved that way. It is a liberal end in itself that you are able to set up a company, a business, and expand it, and employ people, and realise your ambitions. But it also enables us to achieve other liberal objectives, to fund education and healthcare systems, for example, which make this a peaceful, <coughs> stable country to live in, and to promote our liberal values of free speech, free elections, to parts of the world that don't currently benefit from those liberal values. So it is a coherent 360 degree liberalism that we need to embrace, not only to be successful as a political party, in my view, but for Britain to be successful in the Asian century. Afternoon, just checking. Um, I think anybody here may have had this uh, bit of paper that suggests what we're going to try and cover. And um, I think in an hour there's absolutely no chance of us covering all of that. But um, maybe the Q&A can pick up specific points that people are interested in. Um, maybe my contribution at the start would be based on the fact that I am a corporate finance advisory partner. And what that means is that I, I advise my clients on doing something, so they either start up a business, raise money to grow their business, acquire a business, or sell a business. And when I'm looking at a business opportunity or a management team and decide whether or not to take them on as a client, um, very simply the, the things that I would look at most are the quality of the management team, the sustainability of the market that they're trying to address, and the quality of the margin that they should earn. There's not a lot that outsiders can do about that, whatever, <coughs> whether it's advisor or government or anyone else. But the things where you know maybe outsiders can help is that the point that was made a minute ago about attitude. Even if you have a good management team, even if you have a decent market, and even if you have an attractive margin, you need to be brave. We're lucky to have young Michael here, um, a brave and bold entrepreneur. There aren't very many of them. And I don't know, and I don't think anybody knows, um, how many there are out there that, given a little more of a leg up, would flourish. But the fact is that even you know, the brave and the bold, or potentially brave and bold, don't often have the right level of encouragement. They don't have the level of consistency in the environment around them, whether it's the general economic situation, funding, interest rates, and they don't have, therefore, predictability. And when you're a wee bit wary, most people who step into this void of step, step, setting up a business do so from an employed position. So you really need to feel as good as you possibly can. And those external factors are things that, that people like me and, and, and others can try and help with. The big picture, though, is better than it's been for a long time. The, the, we do a CFO survey that we do quarterly and we first did it in 2007. And the appetite for risk taking by business is just about now as high as it's ever been. 
And when you couple that with the fact that there is tons of money available to support people who decide to make these bold moves, there's tons of money on corporate uh, balance sheets ready to be used in investment and growth or investment and acquisition. There's tons of private equity around to, to do the same and bank funding is more available than it has been for some time. So our own revenues are up as a firm and the corporate finance bit of the firm is where the revenues have gone up most. So that the, it's far from doom and gloom out there, things are looking better and it's partly <coughs> because some of those environmental factors have been nailed down a wee bit. People feel a bit more confident in that environment and prepared to take the risk. So these big companies have got a real appetite to invest, <coughs> to, to recruit, to invest in uh, capital equipment and to acquire. So there's a lot going on. A couple of the questions that are particularly close to my heart that we've been asked to cover um, centre around funding. Forever and a day, and I've been doing this for way too long, there's always been something called a funding gap. And that funding gap is usually where the banks stop lending and it's, um, it, it, there's a gap between that and where the private equity is or, or where other sources of finance are. And it's a barrier to doing transactions and even when you get money in that gap it's really, really expensive. The problem is that the availability of funding can, can be cyclical. And the mistake that people make, most startups go bust. I think officially the figure is circa 80% of startups go bust. And if you remember Gary Player who said, you know, every business needs to be lucky, is what I'm saying. He said, the more in practice, the luckier I get. People who go into this less than fully prepared are going to fail. And one of the problems that they, they take on is they sometimes take money for their business because it's available. And there's nothing more stupid than taking short-term funding for a medium-term business plan. And it's amazing how often people do it because it's there. If you're starting up a business or you're investing in a business, there's going to be a period of months, if not longer, where the, the investment you make takes time to produce and revenue, profit, and cash. And the most important one of them is the last one, is cash. And if you have got yourself into a situation where you're repaying the money that you've obtained or paying high rates of interest on it, you're going to fail. And some of that stuff is, is, is apparently obvious. It's amazing how many people um, fail to recognise the different timeline between what they're having to generate and what they're having to repay. There's a few other points in some of these questions that are, I can come back to later. But any business that is, in my view, any, any business that's going to succeed in international markets has to first prove itself in domestic markets. It has to have a robust infrastructure, it has to have the management team, it has to have the capacity in more ways than one take on these new cultures, these new taxes, these new import regulations or whatever. So you need to be ready to do it, but I can't think of a business that's going to achieve its potential without going in to areas of the world where growth rates are higher than our own. And now, the interesting guy. Oh, thanks. <coughs> um, thanks, Shane. Uh, probably best for me to start at the beginning. Um, so I started a business tyre business in Liverpool in 98, um, a mail order tyre business, I was a tyre fitter uh, before that, um, didn't do very well, I mean I'm completely cliche, didn't do very well in school, had to get a job and that's kind of why I am. Could you turn the mic towards yeah. yourself? Is that better? Oh, there we go, much better. Well, maybe it was better before. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I ended up uh, running a, a mail order tyre business. Um, Thinking about would I do it again, knowing now what I know, um, the answer I think would probably be no. Um, and the reason for that is I kind of didn't know the hurdles and obstacles that were ahead of me. Um, and one of the big issues I think in early stage business is that there isn't really an appetite for, to fund, to support. You know, there is a gap right at the beginning, actually. Um, and it's only once you've proven yourself, you've proven the concept, you've got sustainable revenues, that the banks, that the you know, potential investors, all of a sudden are quite interested. Um, so I kind of found myself trying to establish a business in Liverpool. There was no real local enterprise support. Um, there was Princess Trust, which I, I, um, I, who I worked with, who were fantastic, um, but real low level kind of cash available, but, but you know, really very welcome in the early days. I was approached by QuickFit, and I effectively sold a tiny business to QuickFit. Um, because I didn't have any other option and I kind of felt that you know, there's a lot of more learning to be done 
then found myself in Edinburgh um, running the online business for QuickFit. Um, learned a lot about the, the industry for the book QuickFit. I left and started again. Uh, same thing, but up here. Same challenges. Um, first protocol was local enterprise council and Scottish enterprise. I just hands down um, a much better run um, funding source in terms of local enterprise than you know anything that I could uh, lay my hands on in the northwest of England. Um, I think you know that really for me was the you know that was the catalyst. It was the ability to have some office space for free. It was a, you know to have a computer funded for free, to have you know a, a little bit of a um, an opportunity to kind of get your feet under the table and get the, the business moving. Um, thereafter, you know, it's about generating the revenues and starting to you know prove the model, and then it's a lot easier to go and talk to the banks or talk to potential funders. Um, the, the reality, though, is that you know, for for, a, for a, an entrepreneur, in inverted commas, I kind of hate that expression. It usually means it means it's well, it, <laughs> it usually means it's a failure. It's, a, it's an excuse for being rubbish or something. But um, for an entrepreneur, in in you know, from a, a tax and incentive, um, a, a wealth generation point of view, I think they've kind of got it all a little bit back to front because. You know, the biggest incentive for an entrepreneur is entrepreneur's relief, which is a 10 million pot of 10% tax, and beyond that, you start paying 28, and then you've got, obviously, quite heavy income tax on kind of big earnings. So we talk about exporting um, uh, the, the, the business uh, ideas and, and UK enterprise um, out with the UK, but actually, the way we've got this thing set up is, if you get over that initial hurdle of, you know, there being a, a gap and nobody really being willing to kind of give you the support and help when it's risky, and you find yourself with something that's quite valuable, the incentive is to get rid of it before you've really got the thing moving, kind of, and, and you, you're in a position where you can take it out with the UK. So, no, I kind of, I think that, that, you know, that for me is probably the most fundamental thing that we can address as a, as a country, as, as, a, as a UK, is, is looking at how we can how we can turn around that incentive and make sure that at the outset we've got more people able to try and develop their own business at grassroots, right down to the school level in the careers office. You know, talking about this is a viable option actually to go and look, start a business to be a business person and um, take the stigma away, um, and then thereafter incentivise growth, incentivise people going beyond. The entrepreneurs are the limit because, you know, frankly, that is a, a real incentive for people because it's diminishing returns beyond that 10 million quid if you're lucky enough to get it. Um, and I think that's why, you know, we are rich pickings for, for, you know, international big conglomerates who just come in and take out kind of the best businesses that we've managed to, to create at an early stage. Thanks very much. Just as a follow up to that, quite uh, to what you just said there, Mike. Jeremy, uh, Mike's just talked about um, education and getting that kind of option within schools of setting up a business. You talked about a lack of a pioneering spirit. We've also talked about higher education. What more could be done within a stage of education before people go to university to try and embed that pioneering spirit? I think it's. Part, I mean, I, there are lots of different. Interesting to hear that, and I the contributions, and I, I admire them because I'm a I'm a public sector employee. Don't know if we think of MPs like that, but that is that is what I am, and uh, I admire people who are entrepreneurial and are creating wealth in our country. Um, I think it's important that we have a spirit of entrepreneurialism, which may include uh, teaching, in so much as you can teach innovation and entrepreneurialism to people in schools, in practical terms you might be able to to some extent. But it's also about how we talk about wealth creation and how we value people who, uh, who set up businesses. And actually I think there is not an entirely negative picture. There, there are about twice as many businesses in this country as there were a generation ago. Uh, there's about two million now, there are about a million uh, a generation or so ago. There are more self-employed people. And uh, there are a lot of people who are particularly using the advantage of the internet to trade globally uh, when previously they were obviously far more uh, limited in their ambitions. Um, so I want us to 
talk about entrepreneurism, talk about business, not to think of business as being the problem. I think a lot of the public debate since 2008 has sounded very negative about wealth creation. But it's also important in schools that people have core skills. Uh, and it, though you can, of course, there are always examples of you know, business people who leave school with no qualifications and go on to make hundreds of millions of pounds. But you know, what is interesting about them is that they're the exception. By and large, uh, us raising our game in terms of maths, performance, and literacy, and other core skills is also good for businesses, including businesses that are looking to expand and want to employ skilled labour that will enable them to succeed in the future. Just following up on that point, I mean, both of you guys made points really about uh, Ian in particular, suggesting Mike uh, and the type of approach he'd taken was few and far between. Mm. And Mike, you said you wouldn't do it again if you uh, had a chance. Has, has that perception come over the last kind of 10 years? Has it changed in the last 10 years at all, or since the onset of the financial crisis? Or that, has that <coughs> always been there? It's always been there. Uh, I, uh, there's, a, there's a thing uh, in Scotland um, called it's a game called Micro Tycoon. And it was created, short for Micro Tycoon. And it was created by an entrepreneur who was frustrated that there were so many young people in the country who were hopeless and didn't have much of a, a bright future to look forward to. And the way this game works is there's usually teams of five or six and they get a pound on the 1st of November and they're given four weeks to grow the value of the pound. And the winner is the one that raises the, the value of the pound to the, to the highest extent, and the money all goes into a charity. Um, it's been going for, I think, four or five years now. The first year there was 260 teams, and the last time round it was done by over 1,000 teams in November and roughly 500 in February. The teams that do consistently best are primary schools, not business schools, primary schools, and they tend to be. 12, 13 year old people who had no idea that they had the potential to generate growth. <laughs> they had no idea that they had the confidence or the ability to work in teams. They had no idea that they had the stamina and the resilience to deliver this thing. And I've met quite a lot of those young people and I don't know if I've ever seen anything as inspirational as the look in their face when they see themselves having achieved something that their day-to-day -day environment would never have allowed them to achieve. Most, most of them come from quite challenged areas. Most of them come from uh, family situations where there are no role models. Uh, <clears throat> there's almost an expectation that you won't have a job. And it's frightening to see the potential in these children. The, the, the challenge is to sustain it. Um, <clears throat> but many of them leave that only short four-week experience with the determination to do things differently than they had thought they might be able to do in October. So I'm very encouraged and it makes me realise that there's a lot out there that's just simply untapped and how you get them, how you encourage them to believe in themselves and then how you create an environment to uh, take that chance is what it's all about. Yeah, so I, I mean I, I think if making it a viable option is, you know, it, is probably you know, the simplest, most fundamental thing to do for young people because it isn't a viable option. There's no, um, there's no obvious way to, to leave school and start a business. I mean, you kind of just got to get on with it. And you know, despite those obstacles, if you get through it, then you kind of, you know, then you fall into a more kind of systematic, um, well-trodden kind of, you know, kind of course, which includes the banks and might include private equity and venture capital before you know, seed funding, but it's kind of how do you how do you get that kind of real grassroots um, kind of education that actually this is something you can do and these are the ways that you can go about doing it you know and, and you know in the 90s kind of when we had the, the dot com crash there was a lot more um, about incubators you know dot com incubators business incubators and that was the point that was kind of traveling the right direction but the bar got quite high, and actually these incubators were only really taking in some you know, businesses that were, they were kind of hand-picking things, and not really giving um, people the opportunity to, to try things out. Um, but for me, personally, it was because I didn't have any other option. I was made redundant, 
my family wouldn't let me play for a goal, um, and you know I had to kind of get off my backside and go and do something, and that's kind of why I did it. It wasn't really because I had any particular ambition to be uh, a business person. It was because I didn't really have any other options. But um, it's that for me. It's that kind of it's bridging that period of exit school, kind of into industry. You know, making it a bit more of a of a formed course for people to, to kind of engage with. So we'll open it up to questions, uh, we'll take one at a time. Uh, we don't have a roving mic, unfortunately, so if you could say where you're from and loudly, then that'd be appreciated. Um, we'll start with this gentleman here, who's no, the one behind you, who had his hand up first here. Uh, thanks. Uh, Tom Fox, my limited sports social entrepreneurs. And it's really great to hear the comments that have just come across. Um, in terms of uh, the building on, on those two points, um, we've, uh, we've, we do a lot of work schools with um, FE colleges, with universities, as well as direct and, and the critical thing for us is learning by doing. So I think this kind of taster experience at a young age is absolutely critical. Um, we are concerned that actually to embed that is quite difficult. You know, everyone talks about curriculum being already too packed. Um, we've got to find a way to actually embed an entrepreneurial taster experiences uh, throughout education. It's also about, as you said, my roots on. So one thing that we've been floating, uh, which we're working on now as a group of employers is an idea of a, an apprenticeship for social entrepreneurs, but equally that could apply to entrepreneurs in general. Uh, interested in your thoughts on that. And it's also about engaging young people on what matters to them. So um, data shows that the t about 25% of young people who intend to start a business would choose to start a social enterprise. So for them, it may not be about making those money, it's actually about making a difference. Um, and, you know, that, that has a, an implication for how we present this. And it also has an implication, to Jeremy's point, about you know, how we present entrepreneurship. This isn't just about making money, this is actually about making a difference in the world. Okay. We've got to start off on that. Uh, right, okay. Um, <coughs> Deloitte has this uh, programme called Social Innovation Pioneers, and every year we take in about 30 companies who are social businesses and try and help them in one way, shape, or form such that they, uh, they get to where they want to be a little more quickly. Um, so I'm, I'm involved in that. There's, I think there's two or three in Scotland this year. Um, the, going back to that example I gave you about this, this game, I mean, just in context, these, those four, those four 12 year old girls from a school in North Lanarkshire <coughs> took their pound to £4,300 in, in a month. That's amazing. And we didn't cheat, we didn't gamble. <laughs> you know, this was all <laughs> thinking out the box. And um, they amazed themselves and everyone around them. And the contagion of that, you know, the fact that all of their peer group, all of their class and the class above them and the class below them was seeing this energy that hadn't been there before, I think has persisted. And uh, the teachers would tell you that the, the change that that brought over the school has never been seen before or since. And <clears throat> you're right, I mean, there are a number of people who set up businesses for different reasons. Um, and I don't care particularly what reason that is, as long as you know, they, they are for the greater good. And whether it's to, to, to make society better, or whether it's to employ a few hundred people, or whatever it might be, I don't mind. Um, it just gives the whole place a better feeling and a bit more energy. Um, and I personally, in this firm, tries to do its best. We don't do enough. We need to do more, but we're trying. Yeah, I, I, I think the train. I mean, the, the training aspect is absolutely bang on. I think to to come out of the school environment, the education environment, with some tools, or at least a bit of an expectation, rather than no, no, you can't, you know, a blank piece of paper. That you know, if that's on the money. I mean, for me, I was. You know, I did. I, I got an F in business studies. I mean, the irony of it. You know, and I kind of can't. Uh, you know, but I think I'll. You know, the the, the the content of that of that course at that kind of 15, 14, 15 year old level was so off the mark. It was a complete waste of time. And actually, the tools. It's the assessment of what tools are going to be useful. You know, after that educational piece has taken place to equip young people. To, and it, it's about risk taking. Because actually, the more you know, the less risky things seem, and the, the probably less risky they are. And you know, the, the few that, that kind of embark on a on a business career with no knowledge, it's, that's a big risk. And the reason I said I wouldn't do it again now 
it's because I've got some responsibilities now. You know, I'm kind of, <laughs> as life goes on, you acquire responsibilities, which makes you more risk averse, which means that you kind of, you couldn't go six months without paying a salary. Or you couldn't kind of hide in the cupboard when a, a rent man come, you know, kind of came knocking. And you kind of all these various blags just to get through. I mean, that stuff's just, you know, w what we need to do is make it easier. And I think, I think incentives in, taxation at the early stage rather than you know the, just the latter stage. I mean it's about making creating an environment from a as I say from a taxation point of view, from an education point of view, from a local government point of view, if we're really serious about developing enterprise. Because otherwise it's kind of just a local point of view and not really much action. I agree with all that and I think it's important that the Lib Dems tonally as well as in policy terms reflect that in our conversations at conference. I can't remember the last time we had a conference motion and discussion where the central thrust of the debate was how much we admired business and entrepreneurialism and uh, I think we'd be well advised to do that more. I just wanted to make a, a, a sort of separate point which is I, I laud social enterprises, social businesses uh, I think they're really exciting. But I don't want people to think that conventional businesses don't have a social function. And if you take, um, as an example, Dyson, great, brilliant British business, outsourced the production to Malaysia, I think mainly, but still employ a large number of people in this country. I mean, they are a conventional business. I don't think they claim to be a social business as such. It seems to me they serve three important social functions. One is they employ large numbers of people. Uh, secondly, they pay large amounts of tax, which funds healthcare and education and everything else that is valued. And thirdly, they make better vacuum cleaners that existed before they invented them, which is an obvious social function for anybody who wants to have a cleaner carpet. And it uh, seems to me, is, the point I'm making is that I wouldn't have two categories of businesses, the quote social businesses and the sort of capitalist businesses, which we have to sort of tolerate. Actually, I think businesses, by generating wealth and improving the services that people have, and improving the number of choices that people have, play a valuable social function in themselves. Okay, this gentleman here, please. Yeah, um, Michael Taylor, former venture capital manager. Um, I, I'm not a, a big fan of uh, uh, these uh, businesses where you um, try to get people to sell things and uh, get them to get people to sell things and so on. They used to be called um, Pyramid, but uh, those are legal. But one of the things that they said, were, and, and that's what I agree with, we're talking about building an entrepreneurial society. If you fail, fine, next. Don't worry about it, just go on and do the next thing. That's the first thing. Second thing is, the way the British treat entrepreneurs is falling. If you're an American small business and you're successful, your friends, your neighbours say, that's great, how did you do it? In Britain they say, bloody hell, you must have ripped somebody off. And I think, you know, that is an attitude that we really do need to change. The final point I wanted to make was that um, I, one of the things I did when I was a venture capitalist was to, to run a, a, a pro bono uh, um, Prince's Youth Business Trust follow-up fund where we went to see people who've got money with the British Youth Business Trust to offer them venture capital to carry on the business. And that sort of thing, we're not doing enough of. Yeah. We need to, I mean, venture capitalists are really keen, and I think one of the troubles is people who start business don't really get the money. But there are other people out there. Thanks. Okay. So, on that question, where does this attitude come from? If we have a negative attitude towards business or not, as a positive attitude towards business as, say, in the US, I mean, we're the sixth largest economy in the world, got lots of businesses. I used to work for a British representative organisation, there was a lot of entrepreneurial spirit within them, but uh, there was a lot of negativity about the attitude towards British businesses. You tell me, I mean, I, 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 I don't have a blinding insight, I just observe that. Um, uh, and I think it's even in our debate on the public services. I mean, let me give you an example. The NHS. Basically, we've had two parallel debates on the NHS for as long as I can remember. One is about funding, and the other is about structures and service delivery and efficiency. 
and how we can try and make it get more bang for our buck, essentially. And every politician who commits to increasing spending on NHS uh, is patted on the back and told how caring they are. And every politician who tries to make the NHS run more efficiently uh, has protesters outside the office shouting about how wicked and uncaring they are. So it's not, the point I make is not just about business, it's about, it's about the sort of search for uh, greater efficiency, about how we can respond to consumer demand, seems to unsettle people to an extent. And I think that that is a mistake. We shouldn't assume that a sort of mon monolithic, state-run, uh, sort of monocultural service delivery model uh, is the ideal. So I think the debate about business sits in a wider debate about who is on the sort of side of good, if you like, and who is on the side of, uh, uh, of uh, threatening the sort of values of society. And that's why I said my initial comments. Actually, I think that wealth creation and entrepreneurism and employing people and expanding your business is not just good because it raises taxpayers' money. I think it's a liberal good in itself. It's what makes us a more free and prosperous society with more choice for people in terms of the products and services that they buy. So it's an ongoing thing, it's an ongoing debate. I'm not saying, I'm not sure there is a sort of straightforward answer, but I, I observe it too, and not just in Britain, but across Europe, that I think the value given to a business culture, if you like, is too low in the mix um, in our public debate. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's because it's, it's odd. Right, like I think because people just don't understand it, you know, you kind of, if you're the, if you are the, the next door neighbour who's created a business and created wealth, you know, kind of, you are a bit of an odd one out, and it, whereas in the States, the ability to start a business, the kind of, the access to the tools and the knowledge to start a business is so much more readily available, I think, you know, like anything, if you kind of, a bit of a, you know, kind of, how, you know, how, do, how do they get that, how do they get that car? How do they get that house? How do they kind of, why do their kids go to that school? And it's kind of, you know, it's it's almost, you know, kind of just this, you know, this this the unknown of, you know, like, you know, why were we not able to access that? Why were we not able to do what they did? And the reality is, there is no, you know, there's no magic source for it. It's just, you know, it, it, everybody can do it. It's just a question of making, you know, the ability to run a business and start a business. You know, and the tools to do that more readily available to people. That's kind of. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 uh, I, I think it's symptomatic of a few things. The point that was made is absolutely right. The other, the other end of that comment is, um, if if people try and fail, they should be largely applauded, and they're not. They're vilified, and they're pointed at and persecuted. They failed, and it's all a bit of a laugh. That doesn't happen in many other countries. And, and I think that there's just a, a lack of trust of just about anything you can imagine, including business. Um, people don't trust people. And business, particularly the successful ones, are, are, are too often considered to have done something untrustworthy to get there. Because they don't understand. And the respect of these, these, these people who have gone through hell, usually to get to um, the point of having a successful business, is, is not anywhere near where they should be in my Okay, let's jump to the front of Yeah, just uh, Jessica Lando from Elmbridge, the local party, retired uh, uh, from marketing business. I worked for an American agent many, many years, then started my own in this country, ended up selling it back to my ex employers. This <laughs> <laughs> was a good deal indeed. <laughs> so uh, I've seen it from both sides. But can, can I go into perhaps some of the social attitudes behind this hatred of business or distrust of business? Creatively speaking, we, we generated creative ideas, propositions for large com global companies, brands, and local ones. When I worked in Scandinavia, it was accepted that we're, we're all in it together, as it were. When I worked in the US, in New York, it was accepted that that very culture, that, that, that uh, entrepreneur, they failed, but we are in it together. When I came to these shores, in your youngest creative team in the market, marketing agency, when they were putting propositions forward as potential campaigns, were always built on the concept of conflict, being suspicious of management, 
always wondering what is behind their thinking. And let's call them bosses and let's create a divide between us and them. So I felt that even these young kids, intelligent kids from Oxbridge, whom, whom we hired as, as creatives, they were waging a class war 100 years after. What is it in the culture that still makes people think that way? Where well, you take newspaper headlines, they're in the same realm, very much. Um, okay, who wants to go first? Well, well I, mean, I, I just don't tie it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that's happened in recent times is lots and lots of media coverage of big businesses where management has been rewarded completely disproportionately with the performance. That creates a distrust. So if a company's um, financial success has deteriorated and the share price has deteriorated and some of the senior people in the company still manage to get um, significant increases in remuneration, that looks a bit funny. Now, in some cases, it is a bit funny and it is a bit inappropriate. In other cases, it's, if it hadn't been for the quality of the management, it would have been even worse. So but I, I, I do think that the, the perspective that, that is placed on some of some of these bigger businesses, not so much the, the, the SME type environment, um, encourages this feeling of distrust in a significant proportion of the population. So that is an interesting point about this. There is an element of the fact that big businesses do have a different perception to them from the public, generally. Um, do you have any views on the Lib Dems and any views on the relationship between big business and SMEs? Look, I mean, I think sometimes big businesses aren't there, you know, don't help themselves. And the scenario that's just outlined does feel off to people. You know, the person has, uh, has left as chief executive of a big business because that big business has seen its share price fall dramatically. And to help him on his way, he's given £500,000. Well, you know, a lot of people might think, well, if I didn't do very well in my job, I'm not sure I would be given £500,000. And I would set that person's job probably had less responsibility. But there is... Nevertheless, sometimes a feeling that the normal rules of gravity don't seem to apply uh, in some of the high levels of business, and some of the remuneration committees feel a little bit, to me, like lots of people who earn a lot of money sitting around thinking whether one of their peers should earn the same amount of money as they do. And it feels quite, in fact, feels quite detached from entrepreneurialism, where there's a very high correlation between innovation and effort and value. This feels like it's operating removed from the marketplace. But, I quite often say to people, and I think there's some social attitudes, particularly among younger people, changing this regard. You know, maybe people's attitudes towards Apple, for example, a very successful company, but not necessarily a vilified business, in some ways quite an admired business by younger people, particularly. The successful businesses are only successful because customers give them their custom. I mean, no, I mean I've, I've not, in my almost 10 years in the House of Commons, passed any laws decreeing that this, bus you know, that this business will be successful and this one will be more profitable and this one's share price will go up. They're, they're successful because millions and millions of people, including the people in this room, exercise free choice to spend their money with those businesses. And they spend their money with those businesses because they give you a superior service or product to the providers. And I sometimes think we talk about big businesses that has all been imposed upon us. They haven't been imposed upon us. Big state sector monopolies, I could more understand. <coughs> but big businesses are only not small businesses because more people give them their custom. And I think, you know, we end up in this weird sort of situation where people are protesting outside stores and so on and so forth. As I say, as if, um, as if the businesses were removed from our everyday experiences. And the reason we have far better customer services than we did a generation ago is because businesses are constantly striving in a competitive marketplace to improve the customer service and expectation. So um, we do have a slightly as a result, you know, in, in my view, a sort of confused attitude towards business. But I wonder if this is evolving a bit and whether it might be one of those interesting areas where younger people's relationships with businesses are, are in a different place from older generations and that this problem may be dissipated. Okay. Um, I think this gentleman had that. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, and I think it has to start from the schools, uh, and schools currently have our teachers who have gone from school to university, back to school, in the last job they have to find a way of building the world of work into the school curriculum. But the main point I would make is that you know, the current government 
had some mainstream programs such as traineeships, which is the bridging program for young people to get into work, um, where the success rate is, is measured on getting a job, certainly not getting self-employment and certainly not starting up as an entrepreneur. So you know, there are very small things that we could do to measure success and include self-employment and setting up businesses as a success measure. And I would build on the comment made earlier about apprenticeships, um, where you're not allowed to do an apprenticeship if you're self-employed, unless you're in deep sea diving, fishing or something. <coughs> you know, we've got a 20th century <coughs> The gentleman there talked about state support, and like he talked about the better help that you got in Scotland mm. compared to how you, uh, the support you got in the Northwest. Um, how did it compare, and why was it so so different? Was it just the, just the nature of the size of the support, or was it the? Uh... I, I, it was. I think it was because the support was it kind of it came directly from Scottish Enterprise, and at the time in uh, the Northwest. We kind of had agencies on agencies on it. By the time the money had come through the various kind of agencies, you know, it, there was nothing left other than advice, which wasn't particularly good. And there was lots of hurdles to get over to actually unlock any kind of meaningful support. So for me, I mean, what was what was really good about Scottish Enterprise was that it was you kind of you gone straight to the uh, to the source, you know, and there was there was no kind of convoluted. Um, route for that support to kind of get through to get to, to, to the businesses. So, so for me, Scottish Enterprise was a lot better geared for, uh, for, for, for new business. Mm. And Ian, and on that note, I mean, you talked about financing and the funding gap. Mm -hmm. uh, the government or the coalition and, uh, and the previous government have introduced numerous schemes to try and fill that funding gap, as have we have tried to do this for decades, really. Yeah. What yeah. more could they do to fill that funding gap? Uh, um, there's, there's, a, there's a distinction to be made between providing money for businesses that want it and providing money for businesses that deserve it. And um, even if you have, I mean, most recent kind of initiative is a business growth fund um, where the banks all got together and put um, a few hundred million um, in a pot to help uh, young growing businesses. And that, for those of us who are old enough and um, remember something called 3i, that might evolve into something like 3i was, where you know you could invest anything from quarter of a million up to 10 or 20 million. There isn't a lot around that has the capacity to do that just now, so that business growth fund, I think, is filling a bit of that gap. I, I'm, I'm quite... I, I mean, I, I do believe there's a gap, because I know that some businesses, which <coughs> usually are in the... I don't know, the two to, two to ten or two to eight million pound um, funding requirement space are the ones who struggle most. There's a few hundred thousand or tens of thousands around and there's plenty of opportunity to raise ten million plus, but that gap is where there's still a need. Okay. We are running out of time, we've got, if we can take a couple more questions from the guys who wanted to ask questions. Oh, there's three, so I'll take all three and then we'll finish up. So starting with you, Ben Hayes. Hi, uh, I'm George Montel from Diageo. So one of the big businesses that you, know, you were talking about earlier, just going back to that earlier point, um, you know, I think the issue in, you know, if you look at, I don't know the exact figures, but the way people perceive SMEs versus big business, you know, there is definitely a discrepancy and uh, generally people small SMEs and that's associated with, you know, youthful entrepreneurialism that you've described and that's seen as good. And I think, I guess it's a comment as, as much as a question, but interested to hear your view on you know, what, what, where the gap is. I mean, my view, working for one of those big businesses, is about communicating your role with small businesses. You know, Diageo, we work with well over 1,500 SMEs and small businesses across the supply chain, all the people who are you know, bottling the products and distributing it. And, you know, we don't live, live in separate uh, existences. So I think part of it is big businesses having a, a better way of communicating the sort of socio-economic role they play with those smaller businesses and also helping them through funding and you know expertise and those mechanisms. Okay, and at the back there. 
and we have Peter Small and I work for uh, quite a lot of financial accounting firm. And our biggest growth in clients is from self-employed entrepreneurs. Um, and I wanted to hear the panel, especially Jeremy's view on what they would ever perhaps are going to do about self-employment. You know, we now see one seventh of our workforce in self-employment. Before long, it's going to overtake public sector workers. Uh, and at the moment, we seem to group these people, we group the self-employed lawyer or the self-employed cleaner. Uh, I have an issue there, the cleaner being self-employed. Uh, in the construction industry, uh, you get we're being told that all these people are falsely self-employed, but they've had their own tax scheme that's worked uh, for years. So I want to know what Liberal Democrats are going to do about self-employment, uh, because actually self-employment needs to support entrepreneurs at the moment. I don't think any party has really got a grip of doing that. Okay, finally, in the back now. Okay, so I'll take one of those per panel member. Jeremy, can you do the self employment? Look, there is a big growth in self employment, and um, if you listen to Ed Miliband, uh, that's a big problem because he regards these as um, uh, insecure, zero hours contract jobs. And his assumption is that everybody who's self employed, his underlying assumption is that self employed people all really want to work for the public sector, but haven't been able to find a suitable public sector job for the time being. And I just don't accept uh, his analysis. I accept that there are people who are self-employed who might want to get a fantastically well-paid job with a big international corporation, and I accept there are some people self-employed who don't earn very much money, but there are a lot of people who are self-employed who are generating new ideas and a more fluid flexible level of service and goods provision than would have been the case with a smaller number of uh, big businesses uh, supplying the market instead. So I'm an enthusiast for self-employment. In a way, that is, you know, that is the micro-business. Uh, and the self-employed person in time may take on uh, a big leap of taking on a person and then uh, expand from that point. I think the government can help. Clearly, a self-employed person or very small business has capacity issues around accountancy, around expertise. It's very hard for a very small business to uh, export because they can't afford to employ somebody to advise them uh, on exporting. So I think there are roles that government can do to help that. Uh, but I also think the government needs to give people space to breathe as well and you know, trying to make sure that um, uh, there isn't excessive regulation on very small businesses, uh, tax thresholds being increased for people on lower pay. I think there's a role as well for Liberals to, as I say, not just think about how government can intervene more, but also how government can intervene less. And Mike, do you want to talk about, presumably, even part of supply chains and work with bigger businesses than yourself? Uh, do you want to respond to this gentleman's point? Though? Yeah, yeah. It's, so, I think for what, what we see um, working with some big PLC partners um, is, is the difficulty for them in not squeezing every last penny out of their small business or medium-sized business partner. Um, you know, when they've got a share price to maintain and a profit level, and you know, their acquisition cost is everything. Um, it means that the, there's a bit of a disincentive for small, medium businesses actually to engage big businesses in, in, in as much as it's kind of an all eggs in one basket fear. Um, and the, rea you know, the reality is that there is no mechanism to, to protect a, about, you know, around that risk of frankly being squeezed, being a little guy, being trampled all over. So I think for big business there's, a, there's kind of a moral responsibility really to, to, to work with, because the, the corporate social responsibility objectives of all big PLCs will be to develop and, and, you know, and maintain the relationship with small, smaller partners. In, in practice, that sometimes doesn't happen. So I think there's a there's a job to be done there to encourage and develop partnerships. One thing I'll say, which I find quite it's quite humorous, um, is that you, when you when you decide to to, to to start a business and become self-employed, yes, some of the kind of the, the, the 
um, the things that you rely on in life, like a car loan, like car insurance, like a mortgage. So these things stop becoming yeah. available to you. I, Ian Rankin tweeted, I think, on the weekend, one of the most successful authors in the UK, that he'd just been uh, refused car insurance because he was self-employed. And they, 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 apparently he was in a risky trade, and he kind of said, I'm feeling a bit risky, I'm feeling a bit... They kind of, but the reality is that the kind of the, the mechanisms for assessing what's kind of what's safe and what you know in terms of underwriting risk that needs addressed as well, and that's a big business thing. So kind of looking again at you know if you you know a, a friend of mine worked for the for, worked for the councils, got a plumbing business, very successful, lots of work, started his own business, has a book full of customers. Um, you know, can't get a mortgage. You know, it's going to take him three years to build up the credibility to get a mortgage. If he'd have stayed in his old job working for Scottish Power, he'd have had the mortgages after in a heartbeat. So I think we need to address those angles as well. Okay. And finally, Ian, on finance readiness for business. <coughs> so, <coughs> readiness. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm quite old and I remember when I was a development agency and things like that. And I, 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 I formed a view at that time that if. Um, if, if public bodies think it's a good thing to be a source of finance for young businesses, they're probably right. But I think that, in answer to the lady's point, some of that money would be better spent making sure that they are ready for the money and, in fact, deserve the money. Um, so if you put a few tens of thousands of pounds into enabling a management team to either best present its case or challenge what they're presenting such that actually there may or may not be flaws in it, then I think that money is better spent than giving them a few tens of thousands of pounds. So I, I, I think that many, many young businesses, many, m many entrepreneurs get stuck because they don't really understand what it is that the sources of finance and indeed sometimes their customers are looking for before they decide to invest or buy. Okay, we're out of time there. Um, thanks very much all for coming. If we could just thank the panelists in the usual way. Yeah.